You are listening to the Wine Cellar Podcast, where we simplify the world of wine. Each show, we discuss topics ranging from the grape to the glass. Here are your hosts, Brandon Bourgeois and Tyler Schwed. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the inaugural episode of the Wine Cellar Podcast. I am one of your co-hosts, Tyler Schwed. So full disclaimer, uh, myself and Brandon are absolute beginners with wine. Uh, We know next to nothing about the subject. So on the Wine Cellar Podcast, what me and Brandon will be doing is interviewing wine experts, sommeliers, wine producers, and other leaders in the world of wine. Our guests are going to guide us and our audience on the journey to getting a world-class education in wine. So as we become experts, so will you. In this episode, we interviewed trained sommelier and amateur winemaker Ludo Pratico. Ludo grew up learning about wine on his family vineyard in Italy, and continued his wine education in Canada by becoming a certified sommelier. Ludo talks about the very basics of wine and gives some great advice to beginners about developing your wine palate. So, without further ado, please enjoy our interview with Ludo Pratico. So, Ludo, thanks for coming on to the podcast. We appreciate you taking the time to come and speak with Tyler and myself and to help educate our listeners. Now, I've always dreamt of starting a vineyard. That's that's part of the reason I wanted to start this podcast. And I know that you have quite the family history of making wine that dates back to Italy for, for many generations. Now, one of the big barriers to starting a vineyard has always been, to me at least, has been the cost. Like, you know, buying, buying a vineyard and all your equipment? Yeah, like you could never do that. No. It's like a- yeah, it's a massive investment, and yeah. it's not going to pay off for like two or three years. Not more than that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It depends. Like you know, you is it'll probably. My guess is it'll probably take three or four years before you can get it into the uh, uh, into the um, LCBO. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Right, mm-hmm. if because they're um, they should be more supportive of Ontarians, right? But yeah, and I mean, we were even um, in Prince Edward County last weekend, and we kind of heard that. Uh, repeated by a lot of the vineyards and the uh, vineyard owners we spoke to that the LCBO should be a little more supportive and them get shelf space. But uh, right now that that support's just not there. Oh, it's incredibly competitive because when we walk out, when I walk into the LCBO, there's like a gigantic, that, like, it's where half the store is wine and I have no idea what I want or what I want to buy. I walked in with my friend the other day who's been in the service industry for like seven or eight years and he's, he looks like he knows what he's doing. And I'm like, oh, like Duncan, like what, what do you want to buy? He's like, honestly, I just go for whatever uh, there's only one bottle left of because I figure people like it. And then he picks that one up, and then he goes, and then he bought, buys the wine. It ended up being a good wine, but well, still. Well, it's, it's not a bad technique, right? Yeah, but, that's true. But then he, he acquires other people's taste, not doesn't develop his own. Mm-hmm. He, he should really, like, you know, go there, what can I afford? Yeah. Right? Uh, to, to drink per meal or once a week or uh, whatever. And if he wants to drink a couple of glasses per meal, then, you know, clearly he should look at the stuff that is at at the lower price. I'm not going to say lower end because Mm -hmm. you can get some wines from abroad, uh, typically Argentina, that are uh, that are pretty, pretty good for, you know, 10, 12 dollars. Yeah. If he wants to do only the high end stuff then, you know, he's probably looking at 18 to $25, and then you're probably drinking wine twice a week over there. That's true, yeah. So that's the the kind of stuff he has to to depend on. Mm-hmm. Personally, I go for the, the, middle, the middle stuff because I won't drink during the week for some reason. <laughs> Never really felt like it. But mm-hmm. on, on weekends, specifically Sunday lunch, you know, the 24-bottle, 24 dollar the thirty dollar bottle of wine serves me well. That's good because I like those full, full, uh, I guess full body like big flavor wines mm-hmm. that go with uh, complicated meals. So do you find that you're still drinking the same types of wine each week, or do you you try and vary them? I I look around to um, I sort of got my list of if I have to if I know an occasion's coming up and I need the right wine. But then I go and um, I go and pick up uh, some nondescript kind of wine, right? That is priced around that range. I make sure that it's uh, vintages, and uh, you know it's uh, go with God, so to speak, mm-hmm. that it'll taste right for me. Okay. So is there a big difference between like what's like the main thing that you notice between like a seven dollar bottle of wine and say like a mid range bottle of wine that's 
20 to 25 dollars like because frankly i've tried both and i i can't tell maybe that's just because i'm just a beginner but so probably because you've been drinking the high range wine Mm -hmm. as soon as you buy it okay as they age they their flavor improves like their character becomes better and um, when you buy them that they're still young you get the greeniness the you know like there's a bit of a asparagus and grass taste to it or um, even spinach sometimes is what I taste but people taste different things like but it, there is a, a greeny side of it um, when you buy the seven eight dollar one because it's a brand new wine you're going to get that so that's what you're probably seeing is the same mm-hmm. the seven eight dollar wine probably let's say three years down the road will um, mature and uh, it starts going darker it loses flavor uh, sometimes they get a little bit watery De- it depends on it depends on the wine and again these are my interpretations of what i feel in my mouth right, right. the 30 dollar bottle of wine if you kept it right It'll uh, it'll it'll improve. It'll actually be better. But not uh, every bottle of wine is necessarily supposed to be aged, though. Correct? I mean, it depends on the bottle of wine, doesn't it? It depends on uh, the, the vintner what he what he tells you to do. How much tannin there is in it. Um, this is for the reds. How much tannin is in it? If it's a if it's a grape that is known for for wines to age, uh, that the, for wines that la- that will last. Um, I'm trying to think of some examples of, uh, of wines that will, will last. Like, you know, you can, you can leave them in your cellar for 15, 20 years, and they're still going to be great. Mm-hmm. And one of the ones that comes to mind is uh, well, the region I'm talking about now. The, the wines are from the Penendez region of, uh, of Spain. Mm-hmm. There's a whole bunch of them out that most LCBOs, they're in the vintage section. And you just ask for a Penendez wine. 32 35 38 dollars or um, if you go for the Italian Amarones but they're about the same price they're they're from they're they're, they're big wines right if you're gonna have your your big steak meal or your big meat meal I'm not just steak mm-hmm. um, they're perfect don't have them with chicken well it's it's still good but it doesn't do anything for the chicken mm-hmm. and and those are the ones that are gonna last a long time they they get better and better and better as time goes by, um, and they're just a pleasure to drink, right? You don't, you you sort of like put some in your mouth, you swirl it, and you start. What am I tasting in there? And and don't worry if you don't taste, you know, black cherries that have been ripened in you know the south of France. <laughs> don't worry about that. It's just yeah, yeah. I can taste some cherries. Well, you know, maybe they're not cherries to you. That maybe you'll you'll taste them as uh, as raspberries. Mm-hmm. Like I know, I know for me, what people taste as uh, lychees, to me, it's it's it it tastes like uh, uh, honeydew, like good honeydew. People say that that's lychees for them in certain white wines. It's not lychees; it's honeydew, guys. <laughs> that that kind of stuff goes on. Yeah, but getting back to the low end wines, I've um, I don't have a lot of experience recently with Ontario wines. But I've tried some uh, Italian wine, low-end wines, and Argentinians, and um, also South African. But the South African ones are, are tough to get, and they're um, like you could you could leave them again in your cellar for uh, maybe three years, but not more than that. Mm-hmm. And you, uh, you 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 have to you should drink them because, like I said, they'll go brown. You get funny sediment at the bottom, which is really not a problem. But it's the they'll um, they they won't be pleasant to drink. Yeah. So the thing I find difficult though is that I'm supposed to buy you know a bottle of wine in my my twenties and not be able to drink it till my mid thirties. So right yeah, now you should you like... shouldn't even bother because you haven't got a place to put it. Right. That's true. Right. Yeah. What you need is a, a corner of your house that is preferably sort of like north facing, right at the floor <laughs> at the floor level. And you know that it, there's no much, not much of a draft that goes on over there. There's going to be no mice that will dance on your wine bottle. Uh, and you keep it on the side over there. And that will 
will help because in that corner of the pantry or whatever is is going to be pretty stable temperature in the summer it'll go up a bit in the winter it'll go down uh, alternatively if you got the disposable cash you could buy a small wine cellar i think they're in the 500 dollar range i'm i'm not sure uh, and the only reason why i said that is because one of my brothers was looking to buy one and capacity probably 30 bottles kind of thing um and if you wanted to collect wines, that that's what you you do now. You'd have to buy one of those. Uh, if not, uh, get a you know a wine that's five years old, and drink it. But if you're if you want to save your five year old wine, set yourself up, and when you're buying it, you go shop. This is what I have to do. Okay, I'm I'm not uh, I'm not a psychiatrist here that, or a psychologist mm-hmm. that can help out. You say I'm buying this wine to put away, and what I found works for me, two bottles. One goes away, one I drink. That's smart. That's really That's good right. way to do it. I, I can't do it any other way. Yeah. I know people who will go, they'll buy a case. That case goes in one corner and they don't touch it. Right? Yeah. After about, if, it, if, it, if it's something that, you know, is supposed to be best in about, uh, let's say, 15 years, year seven or eight, they'll have a bottle. Yeah. Year, you know, next year, they'll have a bottle. Until they, they get it, they get it right at the peak because you don't know that. Despite what everybody says, you don't know the characteristics of your where you're living, right? The temperature uh, changes. It's not a, a wine cellar in you know in the south of France or in the south of Europe or one of these highly temperature controlled rooms, and uh, that's what you got to do. But for somebody like me, I mean, I wouldn't really have the best you know, palate in the world. Is is that something I can really appreciate now, a 10-year aged bottle of wine? Normally, if this wasn't re- being recorded, I would have decked you because nobody's palate is better than another. Yeah. You can deck them anyways. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, there are people who have extremely sensitive palate and <clears throat> more power to them. I'm envious, actually. But the average person's palate is sensitive enough that once they start seeing the difference... Right, they'll um, they'll say, okay, that's what I really like. That's what wine is. That's what, or even beer. That's what a good beer should taste like, right? Uh, and and then from then on, it becomes well. This is the characteristic I like the most, as opposed to the other one, mm-hmm. right? So you you got to set out there that your taste buds are good. Um, kind of tell yourself, I'm going to drink, and I'm making this number up. I don't. I like. I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't say the proper number, but, I'm, but in, in the period of a year, I'm going to drink 100 bottles. I'm going to keep track of everything there is on the bottle and how it tasted and, and the food I had it with, right? And then I'll decide where my palate is, is going and how it's grown and where I'm going to focus. That's the, I think that's the best way to do it. So I guess in wine, uh, we hear a lot about rating systems, um, so, you know, a certain bottle might be rated a 93, another an 87. Um, how do you step away from that and really just start to form your own opinions? The, so you can't go by me, right? I come from my background, my family background is winemaking. You know, my parents have made wine, like, like put it this way, the locals all had their cars in their garage our garage was spick and span, and it had a wine press, it had uh, a crusher, it had three vats to ferment things in, it had uh, the demijohns that the wine would get stored in. So growing up, um, we, we've always made wine, I've always tasted wine. Uh, even when we were really young, we were allowed to take a small sip from my father's glass or my mother's glass. We never got our own glass until we started reaching 12, 13 years old. And um, you kind of like, your taste developed over time, so I can't really judge, right? I know that I like big wines, the ones that are like, like in terms of red wines, the ones that are like almost black in color, they're thick, and they're very liquory in the mouth. Um, and typically they'll have uh, their own complexity uh, in, in terms of... Uh, like it's more f- fresh fruit than cooked fruit type of tastes in them uh, that that I tend to like. I I don't know how to describe it more than that. Some people like enjoy wines that 
will taste like you know baked strawberries and baked raspberries and baked prunes and to me those wines and I know from comparing notes with them they taste burnt right but that's that's my palate that's why I said 100 bottles you write down everything even the food you had it with I would even suggest <laughs> if you could figure out how much particulate is in the air uh, from pollution perspectives, right? Write that down because that, that'll impact it. I know I've held wine tastings with friends that are smokers. You tell them to stop smoking a week before they taste it and then all of a sudden they they don't do that because they, they, because they think it's blah, blah. Mm -hmm. They come around... I can smell smoke in here. All I can, all I can smell is smoke. All I can smell is smoke. Yeah. And well, you you had your last cigarette three hours ago, right? It's it's going to happen. So Ludo, clearly you know your wine. Um, why is it that you decided to enroll in the Somalia program at Algonquin College here in Ottawa? Well, <laughs> I didn't want to get into that. At least not just yet. <laughs> the um, first of all, I, I needed a, a hobby for a while. And uh, and I figured that would be good, but I also wanted to understand what all the the fancy talk was, um, because there's like the the homegrown descriptors are are different than than the ones that seem to be generally accepted out there. So I I took the sommelier courses mostly for that, uh, also because I didn't un there's um there's there's quite a lot to understand about the different regions around around Europe that make wine uh, and, and the different styles that they make wine in. And you can't, you know, because it doesn't taste like the wine that comes from uh, one corner of Italy or it doesn't comes from, you know, another part of France, it doesn't mean it's no good. It means this is how these people like the taste of wine. Classical example of that is Retsina, Greek wine, uh, that's been it's it's not as much as it used to what they used to do is they store it in in clay amphoras that had been lined with uh, the uh, pine resin pitch so that made it waterproof and the wine took on that taste well when it's hot when it's when it's a, ta a room temperature i should say the wine doesn't taste all that great when you have it um, like cooled uh, sufficiently to i think the temperature is supposed to be somewhere around like 8 to 10 degrees C, uh, and you have it with some fatty food, typically lamb, you, it's incredible, the taste of, of retina, right? It's just incredible. But if you go drink it like that, well, I don't know, it's like drinking a combination, like, you know, like it's like, I would say, not drinking so much, but sucking on a, on a branch of pine and then possibly eating some cooked garlic, like which to me are both, uh, they, don't, they don't cut it. So that's what those are the those are the reasons. Mostly, I want to understand the lingo. Mm -hmm. I want to understand the different wines that came from uh, across the world and what their value was. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes what their story is, why they're like that. Basically, it. I never understood food and wine uh, pairing, and you always always was it was always was fish with white and uh, and uh, meat with red. And, uh, I've got my own opinions now, right? Because you do find red wines that are light enough that work beautifully with fish. Mm -hmm. Like I wouldn't have uh, one of those big Amarone or those Penendez wines I was talking about before. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have one of those with, like you know, fillet of sole because mm -hmm. you're you're just it's just it's just it's just crazy. Yeah. Like you're 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 tasting taking a very delicate fish and you're hammering it with a potent wine. Yeah. But a good. Um, a light Pinot Noir, or, or uh, dare I say, a well-made rosé that has been chilled down to that 12, 12 to 14 degree temperature, because that's the temperature inside those cellars, at least the ones I measured at my mother's house in Italy. Yeah. Um, it, it's just wonderful, right? Mm -hmm. See, I find it a little funny, though, because you're talking about pairing wine with, with foods like fish or steak or, or you know, whatever, but, you know, as a student, uh, as a young person, I might not be able to eat that every day. I might be eating, you know, craft dinner or, or pizza. Is that a crime to pair something like that with a Pinot Noir? Well, the crime is buying the $5 pizza. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, not, if you like Pinot Noir, like, you know, your $5 pizza, the, the way they make the, the pizzas 
is the the, the dominant element is going to probably be the whatever cheese they put on it, and and you're going to taste the bitter tomato sauce in it. I've 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 had the grocery store pizzas, and that's that's what they come across to me. So the big wine will do that nicely. You like you'll put away the the bad flavor of the pizza, but if you if you're going to like go low end, I I suggest uh, get a well chilled white wine. And have that with your pizza, because okay. that there, there's always that refreshing uh, uh, thing that's going on. White wines are a little bit more acidic, mm-hmm. and they're um, and when the, and they're chilled, right? Mm-hmm. That chill wakes up your taste buds. At least it does. Again, I'm only speaking from what it does to me, right? Other mm-hmm. people, they'll interpret it differently. Yeah, craft dinner. I don't know. <laughs> if, you, if you put a lot of pepper on it. Maybe maybe maybe, maybe you could no no but maybe you could put a you could have a big wine with it, All right? I think I need a little creative then with the craft dinner. Yeah, you know I, f- I find it's interesting because I think for our age group, our generation, that wine sort of has a stigma attached to it. And I could think back a couple of days ago, I was at a party, and a girl was speaking with me, and she said, "Geez, you're quite pompous drinking your wine, aren't you?" Sort of in a sarcastic tone. And I had to explain all the merits of wine. I, I would I, before you get there. I would I would see what she was drinking. <laughs> Chances are she was drinking a Coors Light because she didn't want to put on the weight. So you tell her, "Wow, between this and that horse piss, I'm gonna have this." Right? <laughs> that was too funny. But I mean, can you see that sort of disconnect between between wine? I mean, how do we overcome that that cultural perception? I I think it it goes part of it and goes back to what I told you, drink wine for a year, right? And see what you're having it with. Uh, make, make notes and, and you'll be able to, f- you'll feel better about it. But if you're in a, in a party situation like that where you got 20 people coming over, um, personal experiences, chilled wines work better than, than non-chilled wines. Mm-hmm. So white wines, very flavorful ones or very flowery ones work well. Uh, don't get too sweet ones. They don't. They don't work. Mm-hmm. People don't want sweet wine. I, I'm finding, which is fine. Mm-hmm. And of the the the, uh, the black wines, um, the red wines, I would go with some Pinots and some uh, Merlots, right? Mm-hmm. Make sure they're. I would bring the temperature down to that 12 to 14 mark, but I would let them breathe, i.e. Open and decant. Like breathing is not just opening the bottle. Mm-hmm. You open it, you decant it, right? And then as you decant it, air gets mixed up with it, and the aromas and scents are released. So that's, that's a, like a must do nowadays. Is using a decanter. It. I would say if you if you're gonna if you want to let wine breathe, like you know we you gotta you gotta do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, some people believe that it's just enough to uncork the bottle and let it sit there for half an hour. I don't think my chair is exchanged through a very narrow neck, right? right. I got to ask for our viewers at home uh, who don't know what a decanter is. So, like, what is a decanter and why why would you use it? A decanter is you take a pitcher, right? A nice glass pitcher. Don't go get one of those plastic ones that you can't see through, <laughs> and then you'll probably taste the friggin' plastic in it. But a, a, a nice clear pitcher, and you slowly pour the the wine, like you you tilt both the pitcher and the bottle at an angle, and slowly pour the pour the wine into it. The idea behind decanting is uh, that you want to take the wine out of the bottle because it's, if it's if it's been sitting there for a long time, you're going to get sediments. Mm-hmm. And like as you as you're decanting, you're going to see the sediments over there towards the bottom of the bottle, and you just stop over there. And that's that process of uh, spilling the wine into the into the uh, into the pitcher. Um, as it runs along the sides, it kind of like opens up, it fans out, and it collects a lot of a lot of air, which is and a lot of oxygen, which uh, helps bring out the flavors. Mm-hmm. That's, That's decanting. It's nothing. It's no mystery. Yeah. Now you could buy these specialized decanters that you you know you pour it in and the wine, they're designed <laughs> with hyperbolas and parabolas in mind and the three thousand dollar decanters yeah, yeah. that they sell. You know the local. Um, Bargain. Uh, I'm going to say China shops. They sell some nice pitchers. They're they're typically 
uh, they'll hold them. They're they're intended for a bottle. You can see them. They're about maybe eight to ten inches high mm -hmm. at the at the top. They're they're wide mouthed, uh, standard classical look. Very uh, you know, not you don't have to go for the the narrow neck decanter and the bottom. The bottom of it is like you know twelve inches and it comes up in the hyperbola to a you know one inch neck to to the top. Those are nice to look at. They're easy to grab on. They're well balanced if mm -hmm. you're concerned with that. But you know, a uh, 9.95 uh, jar or pitcher, I should say, versus a you know a 69.99 special made Bohemian crystal decanter. I'll go for the 9.99 jar. Yeah. yeah, especially for beginners like us, I guess. Yeah. Eh? Well, I yeah. think I think it's, I don't know. I I don't have any expensive decanters. Mm -hmm. Uh, I like the jars. I like them. The, the, the sorry, the pitchers. Um, the thinner the glass on them, to be the more appealing they are. Because mm -hmm. if it's too thick, then you kind of lose the color. Plus, when you're pouring it, you can see the um, what's happening with the wine. Like you look at the edges. It they're sometimes they're not as deep as the uh, mm -hmm. as the center. That will give you an idea of what type of grape it is and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, Ludo, thanks a lot for coming in. We uh, really appreciate you sharing your wisdom and your experiences with our listeners. And to our listeners, thanks for, thanks for tuning into the podcast. We'll see you guys around next week.